Hello and welcome. Uh, this talk is an introduction to Spine Anatomy. I'm Neil Dilworth and uh, we're going to talk about both uh, specifically the cervical spine and the lumbar spine and um, we're going to end with uh, essentially uh, clarification on an anatomically based on uh, some similar sounding uh, terms. So the objectives uh, of this um, small talk is to describe the different elements of the cervical spine and the lumbar spine that relate to um, pathologies and to understand how these abnormalities in anatomy can relate to different pathologies and finally to explain the difference between these body terms uh, anatomically. First thing we're going to talk about is the normal alignment uh, of the, the spine. So in a coronal plane, um, I'll just bring out a spine a little as well. So in a coronal plane where you're essentially uh, viewing the spine straight on. Okay, um, typically that should be midline or straight. So obviously uh, veering off to the side um, is uh, something we refer to as scoliosis. Um, so a lateral um, disruption of the um, curvature of the spine. Um, whereas when we take a look at the plane sagittally, um, so from the side, um, there are essentially normal curvatures that occur. So in the lumbar spine, we have a lordosis, which essentially is a concavity. Okay, so sorry, this is a concavity um, of the lumbar spine um, from posterior to anterior. And then when we get to the thoracic, uh, essentially the thoracic, uh, as we can see in the image there, has a kyphosis, which is a convexity posterior to anterior, followed by essentially when we get to the cervical spine, which has a natural lordosis. So that is curvature like so. Um, in terms of there are conditions that will essentially um, increase or decrease those curvatures. And uh, an example would be, for example, a Schuerman's might increase the convexity of a uh, kyphosis in the thoracic spine. Uh, acute neck pain or neck strain or whiplash injury will reduce the lordosis of cervical spine. And so this is why it's important to keep those things in mind when we're talking about alignment of the spine. We're gonna start with the cervical spine and some uh, basic anatomy. This is specifically looking at the foramen. The cervical spine is different from the lumbar spine in that it has an extra foramen called the transversarium. Um, and that is to allow the vertebral artery to pass through. And um, the uh, vertebral foramen obviously is where the spinal cord goes through, surrounded by cerebrospinal fluid and the subarachnoid space, as well as the epidural uh, space. And then there are intervertebral foramen, um, and that's the same in cervical spine as lumbar spine, in that the nerve roots exit through those intervertebral foramen and then innervate uh, tissues distally through that space. This is a, a fluoroscopic image of a flexing and extending uh, cervical spine. And um, one of the things it demonstrates is essentially um, we take a look at it, is the movement uh, in through the joints and we're going to take a look um, forward at some cervical spine anatomy and then we're going to come back to this image to further describe some of the motions that are going through. So first off this is the top of the cervical spine okay this is the atlantoaxial c-spine this is where essentially our occiput sits down on top of the neck and the top is the c1 vertebrae uh, is quite unique in that it essentially is like a circle that rotates around uh, this um, um, projection called a dens. Uh, the first image on the left is posteriorly and what you are seeing um, is um, the posterior arch of the C1 um, and then as we go towards uh, the anterior portion of the image um, you'll essentially see that the C1 wraps around. You see some ligamentous structures attaching to that dens. Um, and then when we take a look at the image to the right, um, 
you can see how that uh, C1 articulates with the C2. This is very important for essentially our, our side to side movement. A lot of our side to side movements, so shake your head no, is coming specifically from this joint. Now, um, when we go take a further look at um, cervical spine anatomy before we go take a look at the disc, um, the actual uh, vertebrae uh, sit on top of each other below the C1, C2, um, something called an uncus. So that's kind of almost like a saddle-like um, joint which allows the vertebrae to essentially slide over each other. Um, so there is the disc, but the actual vertebrae themselves have a curvature to them. Um, when we take a look at anteriorly, you can really see that on, for example, the C-spine model. And you'll see that essentially the curvature comes down and around. So if I took a, take a pen here, and you'll see essentially this kind of curvature throughout. And that actually extends backwards as well. And that's what we're seeing in the um, GIF image is that those vertebrae allows them to slide back forward and back over the uncus. The second thing that we're seeing in terms of from a movement perspective, um, if I were to just bring that in a little bit closer, okay, are through the facet joints. Sorry, the facet joints here. Okay, these are gliding forward and backwards. Okay, and that's a second, uh, essentially, part, part of motion. The final thing uh, that, that are not articulating, but essentially, um, from an understanding of an injury perspective, they are the ligamentous structure, specifically in the interspinous ligaments. Um, so when we flex forward, those are getting stretched, and then when we come back, essentially the anterior of the longitudinal ligaments um, are going to get stretched over the front of the vertebrae. So now we're going to talk about, um, in, with respect to the cervical spine, uh, some disc and neuroanatomy. This is an MRI, both to T1 and T2 weighted image. And what it illustrates is in between the vertebral body and the spinous processes, you will see um, essentially up on the image on the right, the T2-weighted MRI image, you'll see kind of a blackish gray structure going through the middle, that is your spinal cord tissue. And that is surrounded by essentially white cerebrospinal fluid, uh, which exists in the subarachnoid space. Um, anterior to that, you're gonna see the vertebral bodies that come up as a kind of a lighter gray. And, and once again, on the T2-weighted images, you'll see these um, almost thin oval-like discs. Those are the vertebral discs. And um, you can only imagine that essentially uh, with degenerative disc disease, those will can have the potential of pushing back uh, and compressing, not just essentially on the nerve roots, but also on the, uh, the spinal cord itself. This is essentially a diagram showing a number uh, of different elements but what I want you to focus on is essentially how the spinal cord is sitting essentially centrally and where we have the intervertebral foramen where you see the nerve roots coming out on either side um, is the bony structures that sit around that because that's really what's going to contribute to the compression of these tissues as well as the disc. So um, we have the facet joints um, as well as the vertebral bodies which essentially surround the intervertebral foramen um, the lamina, which is the um, segment of bone that essentially connects um, uh, the uh, posterior element to the, the spinous process, that will that can also uh, get thickened over time and compress centrally as well as uh, towards the nerve root. And then there's the disc itself. So the disc consists of a outer fibrous ring with a um, softer nucleus pulposus centrally um, 
that can essentially herniate out through uh, the uh, fibrous part of the disc and onto either the nerve root or po directly posteriorly onto the, the spinal cord. The other thing that can happen with the disc, so more, more often than not, people when they're talking about disc protrusions, they're talking about it essentially pushing backwards into, once again, the intervertebral foramen where the nerve root comes out or the spinal cord. The other area that can actually herniate into is into the uh, vertebral body below, and that's called the Schmerl's node. You might have seen those on reports of MRI imaging comes back. They can actually be quite, quite painful uh, for a significant period of time, um, but obviously don't po uh, pose any um, problem uh, when it comes to uh, neuro, neural tissue compression. Um, going back to the, the disc anatomy, this is once again a sagittal MRI. Unlike the previous one that was normal, this is a T1 weighted image. Uh, when we get down to the C6-7 level, you'll see essentially a disc protruding backwards. And on the right, you'll see an a associated axial image. And you can see that same disc. And on the right side of the image, which corresponds to the patient's left side of the body, um, you can see that that intervertebral foramen is open and unobstructed. Whereas on the left side of the image, which corresponds to the patient's right side, once again, we're ta talking about the axial view here, um, you can no longer see that space because it's occluded by the, the disc uh, reading posteriorly. And what I've done now is I've taken that image and this essentially shows what that MRI image um, uh, is talking about previously. So if we were to take that axial image and do a nice colorful diagram separating the tissues nicely, this is essentially what it would look like, that the disc is pushing on the right uh, nerve root, which is on the, the left side of your image. Um, another thing that can uh, occur with acute neck pain is actually vascular injuries and the two nerve bundles that are uh, two vascular bundles that we're concerned about are the internal carotid artery as well as the vertebral artery which can dissect and cause uh, present with just neck pain and sometimes unfortunately not even with trauma um, although commonly they do um, they may not have any other symptoms apart from the neck pain so you have to have an index of suspicion to consider these and therefore warrant further imaging. Now we're going to move on to the lumbar spine. This is the basic bony anatomy that you see here. Obviously five, uh, class of their five lumbar vertebrae L1 through L5 that sit on top of the sacrum. And these are slightly different orientated than the cervical uh, frame and the um, facets as opposed to being more anterior posterior in cervical spine and the lumbar spine. Um, they tend to sit more in a sagittal plane. Um, and when we take a closer look, um, there's some anatomy that you should be aware of. Um, so once again, the facet joints, uh, those are what will prevent overextension of the back as well as neck. And then we take a look at the transverse process, which can get injured from a direct impact um, or um, more significant injuries such as like in a motor vehicle accident with associated pelvic fractures. Um, and then there's the pars interarticularis. And this is very important. Sometimes it can be difficult for um, uh, learners and, and physicians to understand this injury. But essentially it is the part of the posterior spine that essentially connects the above and below facet joint. That's, the, that's called the pars interarticularis. And um, that can lead to a spondylolysis injury. Um, the second posterior element uh, that can be associated with stress reactions are the pedicles. So when you take a look at the top of the view of the uh, lumbar spine on the right, um, you will see the pedicles are the attachment uh, pieces of the posterior element of the spine to the vertebral body. And just posterior to those are the facets. Spondylo what? So there's actually a few terms uh, using the term spine, which just refers to spine. This this can be the cervical spine, the thoracic, or the lumbar spine. Spondylosis is actually a more general term, and it refers to any kind of degenerative or osteoarthritic uh, changes to the spine. A spondylolysis is a, refers to a defect once again of that pars interarticularis between the uh, above and below facet joint. 
it can be congenital. It can be related to a stress fracture from uh, hyperextension, uh, uh, repetitive hyperextension um, that can typically occur in uh, things like gymnastics, figure skating. Um, it could be due to an acute fracture, or it can be a degenerative effect that occurs over time uh, in the absence of an injury. A spondylolisthesis refers to a bilateral spondylolysis whereby there is an anterior translation of the uh, adjacent uh, vertebral body. And when we take a look at the image below, uh, they often refer to radiographically as a Scotty dog uh, image. When you take a look at the portion of bone between the two facet joints, um, and you end up getting a fracture of uh, what is uh, referred to as the neck of the Scotty dog. And as, as it progresses, then you will get instability if it's bilateral. This is just an x-ray showing um, essentially that. So I've outlined essentially what the, what the injury is on the right. Um, um, but if you take a look at the pars uh, interarticularis of the above, that's kind of like the neck of the, the dog. Um, you can see that there's kind of a break through the, the neck on the, the bottom pars interarticularis. That's in keeping with the spondylolysis. So in summary, the C-spine anatomy is similar but has some important differences compared to the lumbar spine. Understanding the surrounding structures or the uh, structures of the foramen will give you insight into what happens in radiculopathies as well as uh, potential dissections and myelopathies. And the spine can be com complicated, but understanding some basic anatomy can be helpful in understanding the majority of conditions. Thank you very much.